Our subject today is how would Israel recognize her Messiah when he came? Now this word Messiah is a translation of a Hebrew word Mashiach. And it means the anointed one. It's a verbal noun. The Greek translation of Messiah is Christos, which comes from the English word Christ. And the word anointed, meaning the Messiah, is found 37 times in the Bible. The word Messiah is only found four times, but the word anointed, which is the translation of the Hebrew word, is found 37 times in the Bible referring to Christ. Now the word Messiah express the hope of Israel. You see, Israel remembered the halcyon days when their great King David ruled them and Israel. He was the ruler of Judah and Israel. And he was a great king. He conquered their enemies. He set them free from their oppressors. And he was a mighty king. And they looked for another like David, who would come and deliver them from their enemies, who would set them free. And so through the ages, they longed for the greater son of David to come, the, the son of God, who was the son of David by lineage. And they waited century after century, and they prayed, and they longed for Messiah to come, David's greater son. They looked forward to the day when God would fulfill His promise and send the Messiah to set them free and to end all of their problems. However, there came a day when God sent the Messiah and His name was Jesus. But when He came, He disappointed them because they had expected Him to overthrow the Roman government and to break the yoke of Roman tyranny and set them free once again as a nation under their great Messiah, under their great King David. And so, when He came, He spoke of peace. He spoke of meekness. He spoke of praying for your enemies. And He told them that He came to be a sacrifice for their sins and to set them free, not from Rome at that time, but to set them free from the bondage of sin. Now this they did not want. They were looking for a political Messiah. They were looking for a great king like David that would overthrow the Roman government. And when Jesus came and showed no inclination to oppose the Roman government, showed no inclination to fulfill the great promises that the Messiah would fulfill. They became disappointed and not wanting deliverance from sin, but wanting a political deliverance, they crucified their Messiah. What they didn't understand was the mission Jesus came on. You see, Jesus had a mission. It was to come and offer Himself a sacrifice for the sins of His people. They weren't interested in that. And they crucified Him. Now, He is coming the second time. And when He comes the second time, He will then fulfill all their aspirations. He will do everything that God said He would do. But He will do it at His second coming, not at His first coming. And today the Jew is still looking for the second coming of Messiah. And they don't understand that Messiah came and they crucified Him. And so they're looking for a Messiah to come. Not understanding that this holy Nazarene who came among them was actually their own Messiah. Luke, the great apostle, 
spoke of the royalty of this Messiah. That as the son of David, as he's called in the scripture, he would be royalty. But when he was born, he was born of a humble Jewish mother. Born in a stable. Born in a place where they keep the cattle and laid in a manger. And everything about the Messiah was a disappointment to them. They couldn't believe that the Messiah would act in this way. And in Luke 1, 31, we read, And behold, God is speaking here to Mary, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, which means Savior. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne, of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now when Jesus comes again to take the throne of David, then he will fulfill the scripture. Now they were given a sign. The Bible says the Greeks seek after wisdom and the Jews require a sign. And so in Isaiah chapter 7, the great golden mouth prophet Isaiah gave a prophecy. It was a sign to Israel so they might recognize their Messiah. And our message this morning is how would Israel recognize her Messiah when he came? And so God said through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 7 and verse 14, Beginning with verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Doesn't matter to God, he can work either way. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. He's being sanctimonious here, but he's a hypocrite. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Then God gave this prophecy, this sign to Israel. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now that word virgin there is the Hebrew word alma, and it means a virgin. And the Greek word is parthenos, and it always means a virgin. Also, we have a mention of the Messiah in Daniel 9, 25 and 26. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah. The prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and then after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That refers to the crucifixion where he was cut off from the land of the living. So in Daniel 9, 25 and 26 we have two references to the Messiah. One is the time of his coming and the other is his death upon the cross. And then as John the Baptist began baptizing, he baptized the Lord Jesus Christ to show that Jesus was identifying himself with the nation of Israel. And in John 1.35, we read again the next day after John stood and to his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, now notice what he said, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. We have found the Messiah. 
the Messiah that Israel has been praying for all these centuries, the Son of David, He is here. We have found Him. And from then on, they began to be the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have a reference also to the well-known story of the woman at the well. You'll remember that Jesus had come into Samaritan territory. And the Samaritans were a people that worshipped in a mountaintop. And a woman came to draw water. Jesus had walked many miles. He was tired and thirsty. And as this woman dipped her bucket down into Jacob's well and drew up the cold, clear, sprinkling water, he said, give me a drink. And a discussion ensued between Jesus and this woman. It became quite a theological discussion. And this woman tried to draw Jesus off by saying, we believe in worshiping on the mountain and you Jews worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Who's right, she says. And then Jesus began to tell her that God expected people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Doesn't matter whether it's on a mountain or in a temple or where it is. Worship in spirit and in truth. And then she dismissed Him brusquely with the statement, well, when Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. We're looking for the Messiah. And we know that when He comes, He'll tell us what's right. And then Jesus made this remarkable statement to her. I that speak unto thee am He. I that speak unto thee am He. And she was astonished. She realized that this man was not like other men. He knew everything about her. She ran into the city and told the men, and they all came out to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. I that speak unto thee am he. In the Greek it is holy on sioi. It means the one speaking to you is the Messiah. That's who he is. Now Jesus made the assertion over and over again, I am. It's highly significant statement because it's a direct statement that He is God Himself. That's what He's claiming. And in the Old Testament, the expression I am was reserved exclusively for God to reveal His essence. When God wanted to speak of Himself, He used the term over and over again, I am. For instance, in Exodus 3, 14 and 15, and six times in Isaiah, God refers to Himself as the I am, signifying that Jehovah is God alone, and that He is the Lord of history, the Redeemer of Israel. Thus, when Jesus said, I am, He was making a direct claim that He is Lord and Redeemer, just like the Father is. Then we go to Acts 2.36, which states that Jesus was made Christ, that is, the Messiah. Therefore, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The realization was struck home to them in power that they had crucified the Lord Christ. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do? We realize that we're guilty of crucifying our own Messiah. And Peter said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so on. Made both Lord and Christ. That word made means to become. That is, by His resurrection, He was confirmed as the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. Philippians chapter 2, 